my great pleasure to invite today professor uh, ekhart shol for our tuesday seminar so professor shol is a full professor at uh, theoretical physics to berlin and he is a one of the pioneer in the field of uh, nonlinear dynamical system and has have a key contribution in pattern formation control chaos and as well as semiconductor uh, uh, nanostructures uh recently he has published of course more than 550 publications and with a uh, very high h index um recently he has uh, been interested in a very beautiful uh, uh, state uh, dynamical state which is chimera and today he is going to talk about that but the key point i want to just uh, highlight here he does not only have the theoretical contribution in the field of chimera but uh, he is a one of those theoretical physicists who have uh, done uh, experimental verification of uh, his uh, theoretical predictions as well so now let us uh, welcome professor ikhart sol and uh, let's hear his talk on partial synchronization yeah thank you very much sarika for your kind introduction and for your kind invitation um thanks also to Jusa for the technical assistance i'm very happy to be here in this center for theoretical physics of complex systems at the institute of basic science in korea and today i will take you on a journey of some recent results pertaining to synchronization in brain networks so i will discuss the interplay of dynamics delay and network topology This work was done in the Bernstein Center for Computational Neuroscience in Berlin and at the Collaborative Research Center SFB 910 of which I have been the founder and the chair for past for uh, past eight years. So let's start with some introduction to partial synchronization patterns in complex networks motivation and introduction and then I will introduce the paradigmatic fitzunagumo model of neurodynamics i will deal with three applications to medicine epileptic seizure unihemispheric sleep and finally relay synchronization in the brain the reason why you see these two beautiful pieces of art at the bottom is that they are chimeras the camera of arezzo on display in the national archaeological museum in florence and at another uh, specimen at truscan art in the louvre in paris and the reason is that this these mythological creatures have given the name to a whole field of research in network science chimeras and i will come to the to that later and give a proper introduction so for the moment First of all, complex networks are ubiquitous in nature and technology. For example, the brain is a complex network of neurons, the internet, power grids. In power grids, for example, it's very important to uh, sustain synchronization at the AC voltage. Um, here you see the power grid of Germany with gen generators in green and loads in red. So the ultra high voltage power grid is a very complex network as you can see and if it fails what happens you can see here this is a blackout in the united states which happened 17 years ago in the northeast coast and you can see that the whole northeastern part of the grid failed in a sudden blackout so one motivation for studying these networks is to understand when they synchronize and when synchronization breaks down another example are social networks and now we hear a lot about corona pandemics and how diseases spread from people to people this is the basis to treat models which can predict how this pandemic evolves and how it can possibly be controlled so also a very important application of complex networks synchronization and desynchronization sometimes synchronization is desirable for example if you have communication networks or encrypted communication with chaotic lasers or power grids or even the brain learning and memory is associated with useful synchronization phenomena 
but sometimes there are undesirable synchronization phenomena like the London Millennium Bridge, which uh, almost collapsed due to lateral oscillations on the day on the day when it was inaugurated in 2000, because it was not foreseen that randomly walking people, even if they are not walking in pace, but walking streaming randomly on the bridge, led to a spontaneous synchronization of all these people and with the lateral oscillations of the bridge, which became detrimental. Another example are pathological states in the brain, for example, Parkinson's disease or epileptic seizure, which are characterized by strong excessive synchronization of the neurons in the brain. So this whole field um, has been very active in the last 20 years. You see this uh, excellent introduction by Pikowski, Rosenblum and Kurz, and also a more recent book by Boccaletti, Disachtschik, Del Genio and Andreas Ammann. The subject is actually quite old, and even 350 years ago, Christian Huygens discovered synchronization, spontaneous synchronization of two pendulum clocks, which were weakly coupled through this rod, even if they had different frequencies, different intrinsic frequencies after a while, they synchronized due to the small coupling. So small coupling of nonlinear systems induces synchronization. And here you have this picture from your tube where you see not two clocks, but five metronomes, which have slightly different frequencies. You can hear it. And if you put them onto this rod, onto this wooden bar and make this wooden bar, allow this wooden bar to move laterally, you can already hear it, I think, and you can see it, that, see it that they start to synchronize. And after a while, they are completely synchronized. So this is a mechanical example. And um, there are many other examples in nature. For example, synchronized flashing of fireflies. Here you have a number of fireflies who are moving around and with their flashes, they suddenly start to synchronize. So there is interaction between these moving fireflies. I'm sorry, can I ask a, a simple question? Yes, please. Uh, sorry, I was a bit late here, but I, I got the introduction. And so if I remember correctly in uh, the example with the two uh, clocks, which are uh, hanging from the wooden, uh, uh, a bar or something like yes, this uh, yes. in the ship. Uh, the solution was uh, anti-phase or out of phase. Uh, right, right. While mm -hmm. in the metronome case, uh, what we right. see is that it is in phase. How comes? Well, um, synchronization. You see, synchronization uh, can happen as complete in phase synchronization or as anti-phase synchronization, and sometimes. The in-phase is unstable and sometimes it's stable. And the in-phase for two coupled systems is unstable, um, whereas the anti-phase is stable. Uh -huh. So, so, so in this case, on the number of, of uh, degrees of freedom, so to say, which part Yes, it depends on the number of degrees of freedom. And it, every problem has a, has a separate solution for a range of parameters. Of course, it depends also on the range of parameters. We have done some, um, simulations of two organ pipes, actually, and this is also uh, interesting. Organ pipes can couple uh, the sound, can either couple destructively or constructively. So the sometimes the sound becomes stronger, sometimes becomes weaker. And there is also, we have looked at this together with Jakub Savitsky, who I think is also in the audience, um, and published this work. Sometimes the Antiphase stable of these two coupled organ pipes is unstable and sometimes it's stable. Thank you. So now I'm coming to a slightly more elaborate topic. If you, we don't have complete in phase synchronization, we can have cluster or group synchronization. Antiphase, by the way, is one trivial example of that, where we have where the system spontaneously splits into groups. Each group is completely 
in phase synchronized by itself, but with respect to the other groups, there is some phase lag. This has been studied in detail by this work by uh, Thomas Dams and Judith Leonard. Other partial synchronization states involve not only in phase and anti phase, but also dead oscillators. This is amplitude death or oscillator death. And um, so we can have coexistence of all these three states in one system of oscillators, in one complex system of oscillators, like here. We study this. Another example, if you go to adaptive networks, which, uh, which describe synaptic plasticity in neurons, for example, then you can have very elaborate hierarchical structures of clusters with different frequency and different phase. So the phase clusters, for example, can have either splayed out phases, equally splayed out phases, or they can be form two groups, uh, not necessarily with the same number of oscillators, one group here and one group in antipodal position, or even double antipodal states where these two groups are in antipodal position and these two groups are in antipodal position and the angle in between is fixed but not trivial. So this is recent work done um, by Rico Berner and Jakub Sawicki. So today I will focus on one particular partial synchronization patterns in networks, which is called chimeras. As I mentioned, the name comes from this fire breathing mythological monster, which is composed of incongruous parts, the head of a lion, the head of a goat, and the head of a snake. In complex networks, this name has been given to partial synchronization patterns, which consists of coexisting domains of synchronized and desynchronized dynamics. So there's a spontaneous self-organized symmetry breaking and splitting of this network, as has been first uh, pointed out by Kuromoto and Batoptok, and the name was coined by Abram and Strogatz. This example of a phase oscillator, so we have the dynamical variable of the phase uh, plotted versus the position of, let's say, 500 or 1,000 oscillators. And as you can see, if it's a ring, of course, this is periodic. This corresponds to that point. We have a synchronized domain where all the oscillators are oscillating in phase, and we have a desynchronized domain where they are completely random, out of phase, not correlated. There are several, uh, well, several reviews and um, collections of papers now on this issue, and here you see two of them. Why is it interesting in nature? In biology, uh, symmetry breaking in neuronal systems has been known for a while. For example, unihemispheric sleep occurs in some migratory birds and uh, sea mammals like dolphins. They sleep with one half of their brain while the other half remains awake. So they can be alert to enemies like this dolphin who is paddling with one paddle and one eye open but the other eye closed or migratory birds who fly for thousands of miles without resting because they take turn in sleeping with one half of their brain and with the other. And these are even uh, <clears throat> experimental data, monitored, uh, recorded data of the bottlenose dolphin where they have implanted three electrodes on the left and three electrodes on the right hemisphere of the brain. And you can see here, we have the left hemisphere asleep, asleep and the right hemisphere awake. And here the roles are exchanged. There are uh, even more recent papers, 2016, where they have implanted electrodes on, in the brains of these migratory birds and monitored them during the flight. And in fact, there are phases where one half of the brain sleeps and the other is awake. In humans, unihemispheric sleep has not been found, but something similar has been discovered, uh, the so-called first night effect. This means when you sleep in a hotel, the first night in an unknown bed, you usually don't sleep so well. So in fact, they have monitored that, one, that our brain stays alert to protect us against unknown danger. Uh, in the sense that one half sleeps less deeply than the other half. So this is not exactly unihemispheric sleep, but it's somehow 
related. Another example in neuroscience is epileptic seizure. And here chimeras have been postulated as mechanism for the termination of epileptic seizure, as well as for the initiation. These are the fundamental papers by Klaus Lenartz and by Ralf Anjayak. So let me come to partial synchronization patterns. Chimeras are on scenario between complete coherence and complete incoherence, where partially the system is coherent, partially incoherent. And as I mentioned, this there were fairly uh, early theoretical works by Kromota and by Strogatz, and it was not until 10 years later that these were really experimentally verified in the lab. There was this experiment, this optical experiment in the Kubovac Roy, where we were involved, uh, the chemical experiment by Kensho Walter, mechanical experiments by Martins and others, electronic experiments by Laurent Larger and Yuri Maestrenko and electrochemical experiments by Ishvan Kis and uh, Katharina Krischer. So where are we now? Almost 20 years after the first theoretical discovery, there is a lot of theoretical work and also now experimental work. And the issues which are relevant today are, can we go beyond phase oscillator dynamics? Several variables involved. Can we go to complex topology just beyond the simple ring? What is the role of delay? And what is the role of noise? I will not be able to answer all these questions today, but I will pick out some relevant examples. And one issue which I will discuss towards the end of this talk is the role of delay. Why is delay interesting in complex dynamics? Basically, in all cases, that is because delay increases the dimension of a differential equation to infinity. In a simple one-dimensional first-order differential equation, you can already generate a lot of quite complex and interesting behavior by adding a simple delayed term like this. Why? Because in this linear equation, this delay generates infinitely many eigenmodes. So these infinitely many eigenmodes may cross over, they may interact, and they may come produce very complex behavior like delay-induced instabilities, delay-induced bifurcations, delay-induced multistability. On one hand, this is destabilizing, but on the other hand, it can also be stabilizing. Stabilizing unstable periodic or stationary states in a complex system. This has been uh, pointed out by Piragas almost 30 years ago, and it has been used in many, many examples and applications. Delayed feedback can stabilize chaos, can suppress chaos, or can stabilize periodic states. Now in networks, delayed coupling is of interest. After these preliminaries, I will introduce the model which we have been studied. Of course, many other models have been studied by ourselves, by other groups, but here I will focus on the Fitzinagumo model because this is paradigmatic for excitability in neuronal systems. It consists of two variables, activator U and inhibitor V. And uh, these two variables are coupled in this way, nonlinearity and coupling. The activator is actually a fast variable. So U changes fast in phase space and the inhibitor is a slow variable. And um, one can operate this system either in the excitable regime where we have a stable fixed point, by, by, but by some perturbation, it can be perturbed to create one single spike. This is a neuronal spike. Or it can operate in the oscillatory regime for the value of this threshold parameter uh, chosen differently. And this is what I will look at in the following. So then we have a, a Hopf bifurcation here. And if the fixed point, the intersection of the two null clients moves inside this regime, we have a, a, a stable limit cycle. Um, so if we couple this Fitsunagumo system on a network, for example, here, we have the uh, activator variable with uh, nonlinearity, non local nonlinearity. We have the coupling term. Here I have chosen non local coupling, which means that each element of the node of the network is coupled 
to its p neighbors on the left and its p neighbors on the right. And so we have two p coupling terms here with coupling strength sigma. And we have this difference coupling, which is sometimes called diffusive coupling. And the particular feature here is that we don't only consider activator-activator coupling, but also activator-inhibitor cross-coupling here and here, which can be parameterized by a rotational matrix with some coupling angle phi. And in the following, we will choose this as pi half approximately because activator-inhibitor cross-coupling has been found to be important, not only in uh, generating chimeras, but also, for example, in epilepsy. These are some very recent results, which I will tell you in the end. So if we have a, uh, a network with these 1,000 nodes on each of it, we have the Fitzgerald-Gumo system in certain parameter ranges, which are given here, we can find this chimera state. Quite similar to the chromatio phase oscillator, but here we have two variables. And in the phase plane, all these 1,000 oscillators move close to the trajectory of a single Fitzgerald-Gumo system, but they move, some of them move in a coherent way, like here, all together in phase, and some of them are outspread over the whole trajectory. So how can we characterize this chimera state? It's, I mean, it's not sufficient just to look at it, but we want to have some quantitative measures of the chimera. And one of them is the mean phase velocity profile. So if we plot the mean phase velocity of each oscillator K versus K, we have this typical arc-shaped behavior, which means that the coherent domain has the same frequency, of course, but in the incoherent domain, the mean frequency of all oscillators follow this arc-like behavior. This is the number of oscillations m in summing of the exponential over all phases. And here we sum over the phases only of some neighboring nodes in a range delta, in, an, in a neighborhood delta of the node k. And if we do this, base plane of activator u and inhibitor v. This simple ring network is, of course, the first thing which we studied and which other people studied. But if we want to give a more realistic description of the brain, we have to find something more elaborate. And this is uh, fractal connectivities in the brain. There are experiments by Astero, Provata, who have looked at DTI, diffusion tensor images of um, magnetic, mag magnetic resonance tomography, and they have found that the uh, neurons are connected not in a solid way, but in a rather fractal or diluted way. They have even calculated fractal dimensions. So in a simple model, we can still use the ring, but now we put the links not in a, a compact uh, uh, neighborhood of range P, as is shown here, but we construct a fractal neighborhood in the following way. This is the Cantor construction of a fractal. If you start with a base pattern 1, 0, 1 on the unit interval, you, we take out the first third, the middle third, and then we iterate this, taking out the middle third here, the middle third here, taking out again the middle third, the middle third, and so on. And after n steps, well, n to infinity means we generate a fractal in a mathematical sense. But of course, the network is finite, so we have to stop after n iteration steps. And what's shown here is the connectivity structure after three iteration steps. We have connections with the blue dots here, 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 here. So the connectivity pattern is rather diluted, or let's say quasi-fractal. If we implement the physical system on this network, we still find um, chimera-like behavior where the mean phase velocity profile has this arc-like shape, but it's much more complicated now. And if you zoom up this, here is a zoom up, you find that it a nested structure of coherent and incoherent domains. If you look at the snapshot of the phase portrait, uh, well, it's a snapshot, it's a snapshot not of the phase portrait, a snapshot of the um, activator variable versus the number of nodes. 
you, you see that some more or less coherent regimes, but clearly this comes out if you look at the mean phase velocity profile, coherence, incoherence, coherence, and so on. And the nested structure makes it very complicated. Oh, excuse me, I got, sorry, there yes. is a question from Jess. Please go yes. ahead, Jess, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hello, uh, I have a very short question that uh, just out of curiosity, why did you choose the fractal uh, pattern? What, what was special about it? Why not just like one in between or something? Yes, well, um, the solid structure like this was the first which we and everybody else looked at. But since Astero Profata found out that the connectivity pattern of neurons in the brain is not solid. It is not like you have connections with a neighborhood with all neurons in the neighborhood and no connections outside, but it is a structure which has some feature of fractality. So the first approximation was to look at this diluted connectivity structure where one node is connected, not with its P neighbors, but with this and this and this and this. So this is a, just a first approximation. Of course, one can do it more elaborately, not by using a 1D fractal, but a 2D fractal, which we also did. Eventually, I want to go to more empirical brain connectivity. So this is the next topic. We have gone one step further from the fractal structure to a really empirical uh, brain connectivity. And I will apply this to unihemispheric sleep. Um, what we did here is we used the automatic, automated anatomical labeling atlas, which is a standard atlas in neuroscience, which labels 45 regions in the brain on the right hemisphere and 45 regions in the left hemisphere. And these are the regions shown. And you can collect data. So for example, by TTI or MRT, not functional, I'm talking about structural magnetic resonance imaging because you want to get the structural uh, matrix, connectivity matrix, uh, not mix it with the, with the dynamics. What the dynamics comes later, we put the dynamics onto this net. So this is the matrix, which our friends and colleagues, Jaroslav Linka and Przemek uh, Chiruska uh, in Prague have collected from patients or from humans and actually, this is a, 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 these are data which are average over 20 humans. You can see the connectivity of these 90 areas. The right hemisphere is the top, and the left hemisphere is the uh, bottom block matrix here. You can see stronger connectivity within one hemisphere, but also some connections between the hemisphere here and here. So this is the data on which I will build the following uh, simulations. It's a weighted matrix, as you see. So here again, we have the matrix and the left hemisphere is labeled blue and the right hemisphere is labeled orange. And now if we run our simulations with the Fitsunagumo model, first of all, the slide, there's a slight structural asymmetry between the hemisphere. If you look at this, you cannot see, but if you analyze the data more, Clearly, it's a very, very slight asymmetry. And this leads to a dynamical asymmetry in the Fitsunagumo network when we simulate it. Actually, it's bistable. So we can have either this is the left hemisphere, slightly lower synchronization, lower frequency. It's, as you see, it's not synchronized, it's actually desynchronized. This is frequency desynchronization. The other half is also desynchronized, uh, but at slightly higher mean frequency. So it's not a chimera state because both hemispheres are desynchronized. Now, we ask the question, can we also get a chimera state where one hemisphere is frequency synchronized and the other hemisphere is desynchronized? Actually, in order to find that, we had to make the coupling constants different for the intra and the inter hemispheric coupling. Here they are the same. If, we, if they are the same, we always see patterns like this, but no cameras. And this is work um, of uh, Lukas Ramlo, uh, Jakub Savitsky, Anna Zakharova, together with Jaroslav Linka and Jens Christian Klausen. 
which was actually published last year, and they have highlighted this in the Europhysics News um, and also in FIS.org. Now, if we make these interhemispheric and intrahemispheric coupling constant different, here you see the interhemispheric coupling constant is quite, uh, quite a lot less, which is reasonable physically, biologically, then we see this state here. So what we see here, the phase, uh, mean phase velocity profiles for each node K in the left hemisphere blue and in the right hemisphere orange is quite different. Here we have desynchronization and here we have strong synchronization, frequency synchronization, except those three little areas. Actually, these are um, we can label them actually, they are the amygdala, the uh, hippocampus and the uh, gyrus parahippocampali. So they are well known and um, this, is a, this is a small, uh, a small uh, question why, but the gross features are that this is synchronized and this is not. And here we show the uh, left hemispheric Kuramoto order parameter which oscillates strongly in time, vertically is the time axis, and, uh, and it oscillates between strong and low synchronization. Here we have the right-hand side chromotor order parameter, which is much less fluctuating, and it has a fairly high value, not exactly because it's uh, not exactly one because it's not phase synchronized, it's only frequency synchronized. And if you look at the space-time plot, this is now space, right hemisphere space, left hemisphere, you can clearly see the difference in incoherence and coherence. Sorry, I got another question from Sariko. Yes, please. Yeah, right, correct. So I have a question. Uh, so uh, suppose you are given this connectivity pattern and the oscillators which you are running and finding that chimeric structure, but can one predict uh, using uh, some kind of stability analysis that at what coupling strength uh, you are going to get chimera? Um, like, is it prediction from is what? possible using theoretical insight? Like what theoretical insight it has? Like when we'll get chimera, at, under what conditions mm -hmm. it will go to the completely synchronized or chimera or, yeah. Is, um, I'm coming to that question actually. Okay not easy okay, it's okay. there's no str yes, so there is no straightforward answer yes, it's yes, you cannot say yes. this is the mm. threshold you cannot even calculate it but here mm -hmm. in this case we we found it by numerical simulation so this is uh, we have varied this this parameter and at some point we found this if it's too low we don't find it if it's too high we don't find it but your question is very interesting and uh, because it, it alludes to the interplay between the network structure and the dynamics and this will be my second uh, example. Now I'm looking at epileptic seizure related synchronization phenomena. And this is our first paper, which we published with Teresa Husuris two years ago, which shows the global chromotor parameter, uh, uh, order parameter. It's again here. Um, this time, this is not the geometric, but the dynamic phase. This is a slight a subtlety. But what you see is the chromatic order parameter as a function of time fluctuates strongly between low and high synchronization. And sometimes there are spontaneous episodes of strong synchronization. And then it desynchronizes. So this is similar to an epileptic seizure where strong synchronization arises spontaneously for a while, some seconds to minutes, and then it vanishes again. We can also induce that or control that by changing the coupling strength. This is for a constant coupling strength, the red line sigma. But if we increase the coupling strength, we can actually induce such an episode of strong synchronization with some delay. You see here the coupling strength is high, here the uh, synchronization sets in, and after some delay, again, it vanishes. But this is not really what we want to do. So in our most recent paper, which was actually submitted last uh, a week ago, just a week ago, with um, our with Moritz Gerster, uh, Rico Berner, Jakub Savitsky, Anna Zaharova, and our colleague Klaus Lehnertz from uh, epileptology in University of Bonn, and our colleagues from Prague, we 
systematically studied the spontaneous emergence of, sorry, I went here, uh, spontaneous emergence of epileptic seizures, strong synchronization. Here um, you see the order parameter again, and it's fluctuating. Typically before a seizure arises, it goes down. So we find periods of low synchronization just before the seizure happens. This is also something which the epileptologists have found and which seems to be really an indication that there is an impending epileptic seizure coming up. Here we have the, again, the, fractal, the same fractal connectivi connectivities from Prague, which we used for the unihemispheric sleep. Here is a, a schematic visualization of these 45 areas in the left and 45 areas in the right hemisphere of the brain. And you can see strong connections intra, this is um, the left, uh, well, this is left and right hemispheres, strong intra connections, but also some long range connections between the hemispheres. And the order parameter over a period of simulated one hour um, strongly fluctuates. So we have low and high synchronization periods, but sometimes we have this episode, we, we call it a seizure if it's at least eight seconds. Actually, we have scaled the time of the Fitzenagumo model by, um, by fitting the frequency of the Fitzenagumo oscillations, which you see in this space-time plot. So here we have space, and here we have time of these 90 areas. And we can scale the time by matching this with the frequency of three hertz of the real oscillations, real monitored oscillations with epileptic people. Um, now we have asked the question, what is the characteristic feature of that connectivity matrix? Why does it produce this uh, sequence of low and high synchronization with occasional synchronization episodes, which we call seizures? And so we have varied the network in a systematic way and looked at various different network topologies. And this is um, actually, I'm running a little bit out, out of time, but we have already had some questions. So maybe I will get a few minutes. Um, a random surrogate where we randomly reshuffled the weights of the connectivity matrix. Here you see a structure and here it's completely random. Also we get many more long range connections and now the general tendency is that the synchronization is much lower. And what happens is that we get no seizures of at least eight seconds in the simulation because the, low, the mean uh, order parameter is so low. So what happens now for the fractal connectivity? This is the fractal connectivity, which I uh, show, well, it's a, a base pattern 101, as I showed you. Generally, the synchronization is higher. It's actually the synchronization threshold, which we set in the uh, empirical connectivity. Here, the red line is what we call excessive synchronization greater than 0 0.8. This is the mean, and this is just the standard deviation on top of it. So if we look at this, red line, now it's close to the mean synchronization. So we have very high synchronization, which is abnormal. In normal patients, you don't get it. Even in epileptic patients, you don't get, get it because they most of the time behave normal and only certain uh, episodes occur, but this does not happen here. So it is not sufficient to look at this fractal connectivity. There is too little variation in synchrony and this is because the mean synchronization is too high. So we have, we have generated uh, weighted fractal connectivity just by randomly distributing the weights of the empirical connectivity to the fractal matrix. Now here you see only one and zero, and here now you have weights from zero to one. And uh, again, you see the connectivity pattern and a long range patterns, long range connections, and the synchronization is now lower, it's definitely lower, but also we do not get sufficiently long episodes of synchronization. This is too short, this is not what we would call a seizure. So again, this does not help. What about interplay 
of dynamics and network structure as in a small world network. A small world is a ring. We start, we start from a regular non-locally coupled ring with no random connections at all. And here we have generally very high synchronization. This is below, this is above the threshold and no seizure. If we add with some percentage uh, yields 0 0.006, um, the rewiring probability, we add uh, long range links in this way. Here you see some of them. Well, the synchronization still remains very high and we get no seizures. We are always above the synchronization. So it's again, no good model. Now we increase the rewiring probability and in this intermediate range, we have a certain number of long range connections. This is in some way similar to the uh, empirical brain connectivity. We get a large variation of the synchronization and we do in fact see seizures um, because the synchronization varies. So this is obviously a good model. If we further increase the uh, probability of rewiring to one, so we get a complete random network. There is no structure. There are many long range connections. The synchronization is high and we again do not get seizures. So this is the summary, the conclusion. There is a delicate balance of randomness and regularity. And in small worlds with intermediate rewiring probability, we have similar conditions as in the empirical network. And let's compare to the EG recordings. These are recordings from Bonn, from Klaus Lehnerts, um, epileptic patients where they have implanted certain electrodes like this and monitor the EEG. Now um, the space time pattern, this is space and this is time. They have only, they have not used 90 areas. So again, we do not use 90 areas um, for the calculation of the order parameter, but we do use all 90 areas for the simulation, the dynamics. Uh, um, you can see this order and you can see the strong synchronization. But if we plot, the chromato order parameter, little r as before, the black line, we don't really see a distinct behavior above a threshold. Therefore, we have looked at the global phase coherence, which takes care of the fact that it's not frequency, it, that it's not phase synchronization, but frequency synchronization. So the phases can be different. Here, the differences are monitored. Then in the blue curve, in the data from the patients, we get a clear threshold. This is um, this area here where which we can identify as a seizure. And in the simulations, the simulations um, of the order parameter black and the global phase coherence blue, again, shows very, very similar behavior as in the recordings of the patients. So this is a better measure. So now I'm left with a final topic, but I'm, I see that the time is really getting short. So um, if I may, maybe I will just throw a few uh, uh, slides on relay synchronization in multi-layer networks. And now we are looking at multi-layers where we have an intermediate relay layer, which acts as a relay and two remote layers, which are not directly connected, but still they can synchronize through the relay. And this is shown here with the Fitzgerald-Nagumo model, again, with non-local intra-layer coupling. So each of these layers is a ring, which we have studied before, which has a chimera state. And now we add time-delayed interlayer connectivity because there's a longer distance, we don't neglect the time delay. And this is work with, by uh, Jakub Savitsky and Irina Amelchenko and Anna Zaharova. We measure the synchronization by the local interlayer synchronization error, which is just the time average difference of the dynamic variables at one node K, or the global in interlayer synchronization error, which is the sum, the average over all nodes. So what we get is this typical picture phase diagram of delay time versus coupling strength, which we, are, which we know from many other examples of delayed complex systems. We have tongues, resonance tongues, and uh, whenever tau is a multiple, an integer multiple of an intrinsic time scale of oscillation period of the Fitz and Abumo system, we have this uh, tongue of full synchronization here, 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 here. 
at half integers, we have relay synchronization. And elsewhere, we have desynchronization, various states of desynchronization, partial synchronization, including chimera states. So these are three typical pictures, face uh, snapshots of the, of the uh, variable u, where you see a chimera in all three layers, and they are all three exactly synchronized, fully synchronized. This is for in the synchronization tongue with a certain tau. And you can see the mean phase velocity profile of the chimera, and you can also see the synchronization error, interlayer synchronization error between relay and remote layers is zero, and between the two remote layers is zero. Second, outside these tongues at half integer multiples, we get relay synchronization where the outer layers are in phase, exactly doing the same thing, but the relay layers doing something completely different. Or, and now this is the interesting point, we can have partial relay synchronization where only the coherent parts of the remote layers synchronize exactly. So the synchronization error here is zero, but the incoherent parts do not synchronize. If you look at these snapshots, they are quite different. And this is shown by this non-zero interlayer synchronization error. There are various other syn partial synchronization patterns like anti chimeras, anti-synchronization of chimeras in the relay and the remote layers, or even the relay may show a three chimera, whereas the uh, remote layers have single chimeras, or the relay may show chaos where the relay have, seen, have, uh, have uh, uh, chimeras, and so on. And it's also robust. I won't go into this slide. And there is some analytical theory. If there is interest in the discussion, I can come back to that. Because for delayed system, we have some tools of approximately calculating the period um, due to the coupling. There is this coupling. Um, we, we can approximate the synchronized solution with this equation of a single um, Fitzner-Gumo oscillator. There are several assumptions involved. And then we can approximately solve the single Fitzner-Gumo system to get the period. And what you see here is that the period is proportional to one over the coupling. One over one plus the coupling strength. So if the coupling increases, the period decreases. This is important. This is also quantitatively true. Um, there is mass, which I will skip, but I will show you these tongues. They are tilted to the left, and we can exactly explain that by the resonance condition. If the intrinsic period decreases with increasing coupling strength and we get this resonance, then necessarily all these tongues have to be shifted to the left as they do. And finally, this is my final slide. Um, we have changed the topology, make the topology um, more realistic by small world properties, like uh, increasing the rewiring probability p from 0 to 0 0.2. And increasingly, we find an interesting behavior of the relay synchronization. And that is the range of relay synchronization is increased. p equals 0. This is exactly the ring topology. Now we increase rewiring, and the range of the relay synchronization increases strongly. This is recent work by Fenja Drauschke, which was published a few months ago. And finally, the brain. Of course, relay functions are well known in the brain. For example, the thalamus or the hippocampus are well known to exhibit uh, functional, functionally as a relay in the brain. This is work by Golo et al. who have uh, examined the mouse brain, and they have shown that the hippocampus acts as a relay between frontal and visual cortex. So our model can explain complete and partial relay synchronization, which may be quite important in understanding the functioning of relays in the brain. So my conclusion, this is um, on partial synchronization patterns. Chimera states are one example, and they are governed by a delicate balance of local dynamics, topology, and delay. The brain dynamics can be simply described by the paradigmatic Fitzner-Gumo model. And going beyond simple ring topologies, we have also looked at fractal and empirical connectivities. 
and some important applications are epileptic seizure, unihemispheric sleep, and the relay, relay function in the brain. So let me point out that there are a number of reviews now on partial synchronization and chimeras, apart from this first review by Panadja and Abrams. Uh, in particular, I want to focus on Jakub Savitsky PhD thesis, which was published in full length in the uh, Springer Outstanding Thesis Series this year. So, and also Anna Zaharova has published a monograph on chimera patterns in networks. And this is a book which arose from our collaborative research center, which collects a number of articles also on chimeras. Finally, let's thank my collaborators, in particular my um, current collaborators and co-workers, Jakub Savitsky, Rico Berner, uh, Moritz Gerster, Fenja Drauschke, and all the others who have left already, and also colleagues who have been instrumental in this work, many colleagues all over the world, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eckhart, for this wonderful talk. Let's thank our speaker. Great. Uh, questions from the audience? Okay, till the audience thinks of something. Uh, Eckhart, I have a very basic question. So you, you showed us this very complex, basically, idea of these uh, chimeras. But uh, do you have some basic rules of thumb for you know, models where you need specific ingredients in a model to produce chimeras? Yeah, yeah. There what are, are these specific of, uh, ingredients? Mm -hmm. One important thing is non-local coupling. So the connectivity structure, basically the chimeras arise through a delicate balance of the local dynamics and the connectivity structure. And it's not sufficient to look at local um, coupling or at global coupling, except in a very, very few cases where there are other reasons. Uh, but generally, you need non-local coupling. So the simplest non-local coupling is, of course, the non-locally coupled ring, but also fractals or empirical uh, connectivities have this feature. Second, uh, the coupling of the dynamics. In fact, it has to do with delay. Um, you, you may have noticed that we have this uh, rotational coupling with a coupling phase, pi half which means yeah. cross coupling activator inhibitor mechanisms. And this is related to the fact in the Kuromoto model, which is the simplest model, just mm -hmm. one variable, the dynamical phase. Um, if you have this phase lag parameter alpha, it has been shown analytically and numerically that it should be close to yeah. pi half. This is mm -hmm. connected with the bifurcation of chimeras and the stability of chimeras, which can be dealt with analytically for the Kromoto model, but not for our model, not for the um, Fitzenabumo. But still, we have done some uh, phase reduction technique of the Fitzenabumo, which shows that same thing happens to the, uh, to the Fitzenabumo. We need this phase lag. It's in some ways a, 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 a delay between the activator and the inhibitor mechanism. You always have in, in the brain, you have mechanisms. It's, I'm not right about single neurons, because we are not modeling single neurons, but on a microscopic level, coarse grain level, we have mechanisms where inhibitor and activator have to be in some balance. And this is related also to the delay with which the inhibitor rise induces an activator decrease. It's basic mechanism. So these two, I would say, are most important. Of course, we have a lot of data on different models, um, dynamic models. Right topologies, different ways of connecting. One important feature is pacemaker. Um, mm -hmm. pacemaker. So it seems that the middle of the coherent domain acts as a pacemaker. So notes, notes near it will get the information and synchronize. And those nodes far away will get randomized information and will not synchronize. OK. Thank you so much, Eckhart, for this answer. Um, yeah, sorry, I can I also ask uh, some questions, Zuzer. Uh, maybe if someone has a question, please uh, stop me because I have uh, several questions, of course. Um, so, uh, like, I would like to just hear from you, like, some, like, you know, theoretical insight, like, uh, why chimera or partial this kind of symmetry breaking arises in a system? Like, what happens in a system that? Um, it leads to like some something is uh, now moving in the coherent manner and the counterpart is uh, moving in non-coherent manner. Like, 
what happens in the system like we know like uh, you have phase lag and with the phase lag you have some kind of competition between coherence and incoherence and that uh, leads to perhaps the chimera but uh, you know, if you have some insight about like um, what is the key role behind occurrence of chimera mm -hmm. it's basically as i said a delicate balance of the local dynamics nonlinear local dynamics and the coupling term so in all these models you have this um this non-local term and this term we have done a study by this is peter kale and others um where we have really looked at the various coupling terms on a ring and you can see and this is also true for the fractal that uh, in some ways the the center of the coherence domain acts as a pacemaker, and it it the others see something from the coupling which is an effective term. It generates an effective term in addition to this local coupling. And um, for for a non-local coupling, this has a certain range. This coupling term. So this means that some nodes far away get different information from the, some nodes uh, close to. And this balance spontaneously generates a state, as we have always in physics, spontaneous symmetry breaking, um, which is inhomogeneous. Inhomogeneous in the sense that one part is synchronized and the other part is desynchronized. Like for example, like uh, for global synchronization, one has this master stability function and using the Laplacian matrix eigenvalues, which also involves the connectivity mm -hmm. matrix. One knows very clearly, of course, there things are simpler because you have the synchronized state very well defined. So there also this coupling structure plays a very important role. And then we know how it uh, affects the uh, stability of synchronized state, for example. And here, uh, like this kind of stability analysis for chimeric state is not possible. Uh, but uh, if, uh, like, given the coupling structure, uh, like when the coupling structure will lead to chimeric or partial synchronization or synchronization, maybe this kind of uh, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. insights um, from you. Of, yes, yeah. there are, of course, uh, the master stability function uh, in its original sense is only available for. Uh, complete in phase synchronization. And we have generalized actually in this paper here, uh, 2012, to uh, delay coupled group and cluster synchronization. So some results on group and cluster synchronization are available analytically. Um, more recently, Rico Berner has generalized the master stability function to adaptive networks. This is also an, an interesting extension where we get away from these simple in-phase synchronized states. We can show that, um, that cluster states, multi-cluster states, um, phase clusters, frequency clusters arise when the, uh, uh, when the completely synchronized state becomes unstable. So this is these are some analytical, some theoretical results available for adaptive networks and for delayed networks. Uh, for chimeras, there is no analytics for the stability because we have a, a complicated system of- uh, Yeah, that I understand that it's not pure analytical thing, but um, okay, anyway, thanks. So I would say we have some understanding beyond the simple incomplete synchronization also, but uh, no complete, uh, theory of stability of another line of direction of research is the Kuramoto model where for example Matthias Wolfrum and Alek Amelchenko have done a substantial analytics on the stability of chimera states and on the bifurcation of chimera states okay thank you okay uh, further questions from the audience Uh, maybe I can ask uh, one more question. So maybe I missed that point. Uh, in order to get this uh, again back to how how do chimeras uh, come up? Do you do we need uh, some kind of uh, uh, bi-stability or multi-stability for the local dynamics? Maybe I missed that point. Uh, That's in order to mm -hmm. 
then get that's a very uh, good question yes yes we do we do need usually uh, the chimera state is uh, uh, one among many uh, multi-stable states and the in-phase synchronized state is usually also one which is stable so we have at least by stability between the chimera state and the completely in-phase synchronized state uh, I guess uh, this was uh, maybe a good answer to a good question, but maybe my question was not that good. Yes. No, what I meant is, if you just take the local dynamics of one of the constituent uh, degrees of freedom and forget about all the connections to the others, just yes. that local dynamics, yeah. do you need uh, by multi-stability for that local dynamics? Do you, ah, need, more I, one, I see. Do you mm. need more than one attractor in that in that local unit in order to finally get uh, chimera dynamics in a properly interconnected network no no you don't you don't I I, the the fitz nakumo system uh, operates not in the bistable regime uh, when we use it, it right. operates in the oscillatory regime so there is one only one attractor one limit cycle attractor and many other models um, which show cameras so the non-local dynamics um uh, well there are many samples i trying to show you um, of, of uh, dynamics like uh, Stuart Landau and uh, Maurice Lecar and uh, right. oh, okay. radiant fire models which show chimeras, although the local uh, dynamics is not bistable. It's, right. it's not, I mean, it, I, I wouldn't even say it's, uh, it's oscillatory. It can also be excitable. It can be excitable type one and excitable type two. There are examples for chimeras. Mm. Uh, okay, thank you. And, and I have another question. Uh, is there uh, some understanding of what the fate of chimeras is if you uh, tune your systems back into some Hamiltonian limit? The phase of the chimera. The fate, you, the, the, fate, phase? the fate, not the phase, the fate. What will happen to Oh, the fate, the fate, I, the fate, I, I understand. If we tune it back to the Hamiltonian, to Hamiltonian systems, Mm, we haven't done it. Of course, we have not done it. It's, I'm, I'm thinking it's essential that it's dissipative. Uh, so I don't think the, I don't think, I can't see that the cameras uh, should survive. I can't see a Well, of course they won't, they mm -hmm. probably won't survive as in this clean definition as yeah, you yeah. can. Uh, uh, I'm, I mean, I, I understand for, you, for example, quantum chaos. This is also, there is chaos. Well, Right. If you go so to what, what, the Hamiltonian what, what, systems, this shows up in some ways in the spectrum. Mm. We have actually we have looked at quantum chimeras. It, there is one paper together with uh, Tobias Brandes and Victor Bastidas where we have looked at quantum synchronization. And of course, in quantum synchronization, we have also used nonlinearity and oh. dissipation. Um, and uh, so it's a dissip it's an open quantum system and. It is necessary. Yeah, it's non-Hamiltonian. Yeah, it's non Hamiltonian. Mm. Yeah, non -Hamiltonian. So the Hamilton in the Hamiltonian limit, I can see no way. Uh, well, you should never say no, but we haven't looked at it. <laughs> but I, think, I, I, I can't see how it can arise. Thank you. Great. Um, seems like there are no more questions from the audience. So let's thank our speaker once again. Sorry. Uh -huh. Thank you very I'm much. I'm sorry, there is a delay. Uh, here we go. I think this should work. There we go. <laughs> Thank always you very some much. Technical glitches. Thank yes. you. Yes. Okay, so thank you all. This will be the end of our seminar, and we continue towards a discussion session now.